so this is this will be the this will be part of a larger global health conference known as the Global, as you might have heard, and this is going to be specifically focused on global surgery. This was a combination. Uh, it was built off a collaborative between the Houston Global Health Collaborative and the Global Surgery Student Alliance, which is a national uh, group of students who have come together to connect schools to build a platform to share ideas between not just um, not just prof medical professionals but also students who are willing to you know get involved in global surgery and residents alike. So this, you can see this Global Surgery Symposium is sort of an offshoot of what happened last year, which was the Boston Global Surgery Symposium. It was started by a bunch of students uh, at Harvard Medical School and was very successful. And we decided to follow it up here in Houston. And this symposium is actually streamed live, not just for around the nation, but also for everybody else around the world to see, because that is an issue of the field of global surgery. And that's kind of our goal here is to bring everyone together in one platform and this will be the first of its kind in Houston, just to bring everybody here and because we have such great individuals who are willing to be dedicated and involved in uh, global surgery. So I think the bottom line is we're just excited to have, you know, um, different panels and the ways it's going to work is there will be different panels con uh, consisting of various speakers in each panel. The first panel will be the subspecialties in global surgery. This is all in your booklet, but I'm just going to do a quick overview. And the second one will be capacity building. And then we'll finish off with the pathways to global surgery. And then the keynote given by Dr. Ray Price uh, will be at the very end. It'll be the closing keynote of the thing. And then that will be followed by a cocktail reception at the very end. So we're very glad to have that program of speakers. Uh, we'll essentially have everybody talk first, and the Q&A will be held to the very end. Um, and you are welcome to clap between speakers as well. I know that's always a question. Um, there is one message I'd like to read from the National Global Surgery Student Alliance um, because they are, uh, they did help us, you know, kind of advertise around the nation. Um, you know, they basically wanted to say, you know, some of the things that they've been working on. So the national chair, uh, Parissa Fala said, uh, one year ago, a team of students uh, came together to create this alliance, um, which has uh, been running since March of 2017, since they hosted the Global Surgery Symposium. Um, that brought over, you know, 200 attendees and, and online there were, you know, close to 20,000 people that you know, viewed in around the world. And so, uh, you know, that's what we're excited about here. And recently they've increased the national team of 21 students from 12 different institutions and are taking on projects, including advocacy, education, research. Um, they're really, really excited about having a national advisory board that also includes not just, uh, you know, attending, but also residents and uh, sort of, uh, people of that like. Um, they're also working with the international partners uh, known as Incision um, to connect over 20 different nations worldwide. And, you know, what they, they are, they're very grateful for the collaboration globally. Um, they, they also wanted to uh, make it known that they're making toolkits about global surgery education and also developing a database um, of projects uh, to connect residents and students um, around the nation. Um, and they're also starting a new membership uh, for residents as well to be involved in this uh, alliance and hopefully be able to connect people at different phases in their training and different very excited to have that. And so without further ado, I'll just start off on the first panel because we are we want to keep everything in time today. And so the first panel will be Dr. Olatoye, uh, Dr. Lam, and uh, Dr. Guy. Um, so essentially we'll have, we have a couple moderators here, um, Meg, uh, Megan Vu and Yomna Sheriff, who are both involved in the Global Surgery Fellowship Program and have been generous enough to d dedicate their busy lives and dedicate some time to come here and help. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Vivek. Uh, my name is Megan Vu. I'm one of the general surgery residents at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, once again, I welcome you all again to Glocal, and uh, thank you for dedicating your time and your busy lives to come here. Um, so I have the privilege um, to present our first uh, speaker, um, Dr. Olatoya. Dr. Olatoya is a professor of surgery, pediatrics, and obstetrics and gynecology at Baylor College of Medicine and is co-director of the Texas Children's Fetal Center at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. Dr. Olatoya also serves as co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Global Surgery and Anesthesiology Program, co-chair of the Texas Children's Hospital Global Health Steering Committee, and is a member of the leadership team of Texas Children's Global Hematology, Oncology, Pediatric Excellence a public-private partnership to establish an innovative pediatric hematology oncology treatment network in Southern and East Africa. Dr. Olatoya has also participated in over 30 medical missions to Russia, 
Guatemala, Haiti, Malawi, Botswana, and Liberia. Um, please welcome Dr. Oljoy. Good afternoon. It's indeed a pleasure to be here to uh, talk with this group. Again, this is a group that's really an exciting opportunity to be part of. Uh, excellent work being done by everyone concerned here. and really a privilege to just share some thoughts with you. I titled my talk, Children's Surgery at Home and Abroad, and Some Lessons Learned Over a Period of Time. This is the uh, section on surgical specialties. And as you heard, I'm a pediatric surgeon primarily. And and so over the next few minutes, I'll give you some thoughts on my ideas about how I got involved in global surgery. So first, I have no financial conflicts of interest. And uh, what I hope to share with you is first, why am I interested in global surgery? And so for that, I'll give you a little bit about my history and, and how I got to be here. And then why specifically, why children's surgery? And finally, maybe some questions for you, why not you? Now, that's probably preaching to the fire for those of you that are here. For those of you that haven't been involved, you have to ask that question, why not? So I was born in Nigeria and I grew up in Nigeria. Went to medical school in Nigeria, spent all my time there, most of my adult life, and obviously I wanted to study medicine. I was privileged to go to medical school there in Ileife, and uh, the medical training in Nigeria is such that by the time you're done, you're expected to go out and be the physician, possibly the only physician around for hundreds of miles. And so your the education is such that you should be competent to do most of the common medical and surgical procedures and emergencies and be able to handle them. Because many times you are indeed the only physician for hundreds of times. But I was always interested in doing more. I wanted to excel. I wanted to have the opportunity to grow and, and be exposed to other avenues. So I decided to come to the United States for, for the postgraduate training. I, uh, came to the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, where I actually did my general surgery training. I also did some research in fetal wound healing and got interested in fetal research, et cetera. And did pediatric surgery at Philadelphia Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And got interested, uh, again, learned a lot about fetal surgery and different aspects of surgery. And when I came to the US, my plan was obviously to go back and help kids. Because actually part of the reason I got interested was growing up in medical school, uh, during my, in fact, during my rotation as an intern in Lagos. What drove me to pediatric surgery was really the fact that there were many children in the hospital running around with colostomies, waiting for the definitive surgery. As you can imagine, at that time, these kids have colostomies and they couldn't go home because they were all covered in a stool and had rags. You can imagine they don't ask me that, so they have rags and most of them have them. They served as the little runners for the kids because they otherwise helped them. So they were runners for the nurses who were stuff around in different wards. But they stayed in the hospital because there was no opportunity for them to get their native care. And so until they could get that done, many of them really were wards of the hospital. The families came to visit, but they stayed most of the time in the hospital. Otherwise, they Now remember, these are the fortunate ones. These are the ones that actually had to get, got to have a colostomy. Because those that didn't would have died of it. And so my interest was to learn all I could about pediatric surgery and hopefully after getting down to go back to Nigeria to help out. For a variety of reasons beyond the, beyond the, uh, beyond the context of this talk, I ended up in Houston, Texas Children's Hospital. Phenomenal things. Got to learn a lot, draw a lot, develop a lot here, and got to be part of an excellent team of surgeons taking care of lots of complex cases got to be part of the fetal surgery program here and help develop expertise in doing things that were really truly mind-boggling. And so you could say, well, maybe I was one of those that have sort of the brain drain and I've actually gone away from what I started off to do. And actually, if you think about it, you look at this slide, which just shows what brain drain is. So in red, actually, are the countries that have suffered what we call minor brain drain. So many of these people have left. Those in black, actually, are 
those that have suffered major brain drain. So a large proportion of expertise in those countries are going to other areas. Again, when you point out to Nigeria, it's very solidly black, right? Now, where have these people gone? In blue, you find countries that have, you know, that have really benefited some from that minor, what they call brain gain. But in green, the US, Canada, and Australia are the countries that have actually benefited the most from this brain gain. Here we are at the Texas Medical Center, the finest of its type all over the world. Different institutions, many specialties, excellent hospitals, providing the finest care all over the world, benefiting from a lot of that gain. I'm part of a group of pediatric surgeons. Now our group actually has about 18 pediatric surgeons. When the city of Houston that has what, a population of about 4 million, just in Houston alone, there are probably about 30 pediatric surgeons. In Houston alone. Look at the physicians per capita. Again, look at the United States, swollen and ballooned with lots of physicians. Here's Africa. You can't even see Nigeria here. It's all shrunk. Again, for the lack of physicians. There. Rain. Gain. If you look specifically, about surgeons, uh, surgeons, anesthesiologists, and obstetricians. So the lighter colors of your see are those that lack less than one or one, between one and 15 of these per 100,000 population. And those in darker green, uh, over 60 or even over 100, or 100,000 population. Again, you can see most of Africa has very light colors. And these areas here, of course, the US in particular, solid green, gray. Now here we're in the United States, right? Very diverse population from different ages. But children actually are maybe 15% of the entire population in the United States. Contrast that with a country like Malawi. Children less than 20 make up almost 50% of the entire population. Well, Malawi is a small country. Maybe the whole population of Malawi is probably about four or five. Well, how about a country like Nigeria? Population of about 180, 190 million. Same thing. But if you actually look at countries, you know, high income countries, US, Germany, Sweden, demographics are similar. Look at the low middle income countries, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Malawi. It's the reverse. The children are all in these areas where there's a drain, and not as much where there's a gain. What do these children need? I told you about my experience with imperfect illness. Here's a child who at 18 months hasn't really had imperfect illness repair. Again, this is a, one of the fortunate ones. This child was actually fortunate to be born where there was someone, maybe a surgeon, maybe a clinical officer, that was able to perform a colostomy, probably under local anesthesia because there was no anesthetics or no anesthesiologist available to help perform that procedure. But with that being done, this child's life was saved so that hopefully someone can come and help provide definitive surgery. This child is otherwise fine, except can go to school because it's covered in school, can really be a member of society because it's something that could easily fix. There's another child with a neck mask, still alive at six months. Wouldn't be for much longer if this mask continues to expand and grow and compress the airway. Something that could be addressed that could save this child's life, could this, make this child a useful member of society. Take a coccygeal teratomas. Still benign at this point, maybe for a little longer, will probably become malignant, result in the death of this child, and prevent issues. Ovarian teratomas. Even simple things like extremity masses. There's a child that just has a lump on the, on the arm. Probably could be fixed, but this concern, this may damage the child's hand, is why. Right. Right on, maybe you wouldn't be able to function, may not be able to work, may not be able to earn a living. Again, having competence, surgeons that could help take care of this, is a good move to help this child out. Burns. Now, burns is a disease of the fall. People that fall into open fires, open fires left around, using unsafe cooking materials. These are things we hardly see very much here 
in the Western world. But a common problem in low medium income countries where surgeons are needed. Now, this is an adult person which I put in specifically because this lady actually suffered severe tertiary burns because she had epilepsy. She fell into an open fire water. But obviously, she did not have enough, I mean, in the field of seizures, could not remove herself from the suspect. She suffered severe tertiary burns. Again, we could go with the team to actually help their disorders. Seven year old presents with an abdominal mass. Huge mass. Obviously, this child hasn't gone to school for a while. Turns out to be a large renal mass, a Rome tumor. This is after five rounds of chemotherapy. <coughs> the magnitude of tumors and sizes you see over there that just goes beyond what we can put for here. But then again, and take care of that child and return the child to it. But it's not just enough to offer these services, but it's important to teach those there to actually do this. Not just to go and provide care, not just to help children out there, but to teach those that are there to be able to care for them. Either talking about the surgeons that are there, the medical personnel that are there, or even whoever it is that's providing surgical care, just to make sure that the care can be provided to those who need them. Because the goal is you as a person can do much. But if you train the trainers and continue that and let it spread out, there will be the opportunity for others to get trained. Not to talk of, even for our trainees, that have the opportunity to be exposed to diseases and, and conditions beyond what they would ever see here in the medical center. So again, you have to be aware of what you're dealing with when you go there. Limited resources, limited facilities, lack of running water, you know, so each time you turn on the shower and you just go talking while you're brushing your teeth, let the water run. Here we are in an operating room, and this is our access. You can see water for theater of four. That's water provided for that operating room. Being willing to adapt to situations where you find yourself and yet being able to help. Because the goal is not just to go and train people or get people trained, but help them to work in an environment where they exist and improve the environment for the betterment of everyone else. Realize that things are not going to be the way they are, where you are. And here's a child with a diatomy pad. It's just really a metal plate slab with glassy. Makes good enough contact, that's a surgery done. Again, learn what you can, be flexible, be willing to do. Remember, the more we go, we deliver and we offer hope and we offer help, but we learn a lot more in terms of innovation, in terms of the challenges that they have, what they need and how we can impact them and how we can actually come back home and change some of the things we do from the things we've learned on the field. Anesthesia remains a major concern, especially for children's surgery. You can't really do much without anesthesia. Here's a child, here, here, here's an anesthesiologist who is actually taking care of two kids at the same time. Why? Because one has just finished surgery, the one in the background, and the one in the foreground is the one just about to undergo surgery. But because there is an effective post anesthesia care, it's important for the anesthesiologist to actually keep an eye on this other child in plain sight. And so that child is recovered enough to now go out of the sight of that anesthesiologist. So again, it's not just important to go with the team and provide care, but also help with the nursing, help with the post anesthesia care, help develop the entire infrastructure. We all talk about not giving someone a fish, but teaching them how to fish. I heard the other day, it's not just enough to teach them how to fish, but let's go fish together so we can all go to I think what's probably even important too is let's go fish together, but not using my own fishing pole, using their own fishing pole, because that's what they're going to have after we're done, and that's what they're going to use. So when we go, we try to use what they have, use what they're doing with, and help them to be able to function within the confines of, of, what, of the limitations they have. So it's important as you go to go with resources. You don't want to use up the resources that are already there. Medical bridges here in Houston has been very helpful, obviously, in providing services and resources that can, that can take along. We work with partners on the ground. There's this in Jose in Sangerina, Tanzania, at one of the mission hospitals there. They've been working with those there, so there's continuity of care. So you're not providing itinerant care that you come in and you leave, but actually help things to continue. Take resources for what you need, but also leave stuff behind so that others can benefit from what you provided. It's important to teach. 
even if it's putting a white sheet up on the board and projecting on it so you can have a PowerPoint presentation, whatever it takes, engage, educate, teach, and bring others along. So again, here we are with large numbers of surgeons, anesthesiologists, substitutions, medical students, all those here, so many of us in the medical center, with all the opportunities we have surrounding us. There's a huge need out there. So why won't you go? Um, as a reminder, we're holding all the questions until the uh, three speakers have, have uh, finished all their presentations, and then we'll take all the questions at once. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lam. Dr. Lam is an associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery section of Pediatric Neurosurgery. Aligning with the efforts of her mentor to develop pediatric neurosurgery in the developing world, Dr. Lam contributes to building a sustainable pediatric neurosurgery service and clinical training program in Kenya, along with other international neurosurgery efforts. Uh, please welcome Dr. Lin. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share our experience. Um, and th this is perfect to, to follow Dr. Olatoya because this is um, an example of um, how we do pediatric neurosurgery and how we have try to really aim towards sustainability in terms of developing a pediatric neurosurgery program in Kenya. So if you look at me, like, I don't belong in Kenya. Like, what am I doing there? You know, I, but it really is um, something that I did for my pediatric neurosurgery mentor at first. And it was right after fellowship, I was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and I was like, hey, he lives in Kenya. I'm going to go there. And then it, it, I found that it was this great need and this in, incredible place um, that we really can contribute to. Um, so Dr. Olatoy already kind of set the stage, so I won't really go over the need for, for global, thank you, <laughs> for, for, for why do global surgery and, um, and, and why um, you know, donate your resources and, and time and, and engagement there. But in terms of just neurosurgeons, um, if you look at the gap in terms of low and middle income countries and, uh, and high income countries, um, you'll actually see that there's 90,000 more neurosurgeons needed in the world. Uh, in terms of looking at why focus on children, I think Dr. Olatoy explained um, the, the gap there. And if you look at the maps for where uh, the the pediatric population is concentrated in the world, and the population with limited access to surgical care, you'll see that the dark red and uh, the blue really overlap. In terms of the subspecialty of pediatric neurosurgery, there's actually a lot of work being done, um, at first in silos, uh, and you'll uh, recognize some of these names, like Benjamin Wharf, he won the uh, MacArthur Genius Award for um, using an endoscope, a flexible endoscope to try to treat hydrocephalus to not put in the implant uh, of a ventricular peritoneal shunt and really revolutionized the way that we thought about how to treat hydrocephalus. But he did this in, in basically the, the, what we call a pediatric neurosurgery battleground pretty much of, uh, of Uganda where there's a lot of post-infectious hydrocephalus. And then my mentor, Leland Albright, uh, he moved with his wife, a pediatric uh, neurosurgery nurse practitioner, uh, and they lived in Africa for five years and really developed this pediatric neurosurgery service in Punjabi, Kenya. And then other neurosurgeons kind of talking about, well, what does this mean? You know, how do we actually deliver care from here with a, a few people who are living uh, in in places like Africa or Southeast Asia. So the example uh, I'll show you is Kenya. So you look at a population of 48 million people in this country, there are 20 neurosurgeons, and uh, pretty much uh, 17 of them are in cities. And uh, there's one pediatric neurosurgeon and, uh, and a couple more who are kind of in, in um, uh, far-flung places. But pretty much everybody who's trained lives in Nairobi 
and uh, prefers to take private insurance. And the brain drain that Dr. Olatoya was talking about is very apparent there. So Kijabe uh, was actually built as a, uh, as a site to avoid malaria. So there's actually a, a lot of winds. It's on the edge of the Great Rift Valley and, uh, and Kijabe Hospital was built there. So you'll see Kijabe Hospital, um, you know, how do we, you know, how do we actually go uh, deliver care? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very modest place, uh, but it actually has a 300 beds and uh, the laundry is done by the mothers. And this is what a, a ward looks like. Um, the curtains kind of come down for privacy, but you'll see that that's really not a thing. Uh, the, the mothers um, sleep in the beds and take care of the children and the nurses come and distribute medications. But the dressing changes and everything are actually done by the mothers. This is the way that we actually keep track of where the patients are. Um, in the adult ward, it's not uncommon for a neurosurgery patient to be um, kind of lost for a few days. If they're a little confused or delirious, uh, you know, they don't really have a name tag and you're looking for somebody, this board might be updated every three days, maybe not. Somebody might be, go, uh, might be talking to a friend. You might not be able to find them for surgery that day. Um, these are different types of ventilators. Um, and as Dr. Olatoya said, you, you kind of make do with what you have. You'll, you'll bring things, but you have to kind of work with what you have. Um, this is a, a way to kind of temperature regulate for a, uh, for a tiny baby. And then also there's a price list, which is something that you typically don't see in the United States, right? There's insurance, there's Medicaid, there's a lot of um, uh, smoke and mirrors. And if you ask how much something is, probably won't know. But here there's a price list and if you don't pay up front, you're not going to get the surgery. So um, so sometimes families will um, go home, they'll go back to their village, they'll have a, um, a harambe, um, a um, kind of a, a village dinner where they, um, uh, where um, funds are raised um, so that uh, they can actually have funds to come back and pay for, uh, pay for the surgery. So when you go there, you realize that poverty actually affects every single medical decision. And it's not something that, that we as practitioners get to really pick, right? So there's delayed presentation of a, of a lot of pathophysiology. There's poor hygiene. Um, there's a lot of malnutrition. Um, and some go to traditional healers first. So for a, a child with hydrocephalus, um, you'll see that uh, there are some different burns. Um, and that's actually inside, there's a, a brain tumor causing the hydrocephalus. You'll see other types of patterns of burns. Um, and that was actually a TB of the spine. Um, the operating room looks actually much like what Dr. Olotoy, um showed. And I've never been to your hospital. You've never come to this hospital. Um, but the, the conditions look very similar. Um, you make do with how you, how you prep. Um, and uh, the, the supplies are actually very well organized, uh, but it's, uh, they're a little bit meager, so you definitely have to bring some. Um, our scrub techs are also the room turnover and, uh, and uh, janitors. Um, we also, uh, you know, mop and scrub everything. And, uh, and the anesthesia equipment and the tubing is reused. Uh, this is the um, one square meal that most people in the operating theater, um, in terms of the nurses and the techs, get um, every day. Uh, and there's a lunch time uh, in the chai room. So um, I'll kind of scroll through a bunch of um, cases that we typically don't see as much in the United States uh, that we see a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I can tell you, so for myelomeningocele, um, there's a, a high prevalence in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, uh, you know, in the States, we think of this as a folate supplementation problem. But um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's uh, two wet seasons a year or two rainy seasons a year. So the corn, um, the, the staple actually uh, gets wet and then dries and then gets wet and dries. Um, and that um, uh, can support a mycotoxin or, or a uh, fungus in the corn that will cause a folate resistance that's about eight times worse than a uh, folate um, deficiency in the diet. So I think a lot of this is really, it's not like surgeons can come fix the whole problem. It really needs public health and, and a lot of other pieces of the puzzle. So these are myelomeningocele. I can tell you one of my partners did his um, fellowship in Toronto and he said in his entire fellowship year, he saw one myelomeningocele. Um, and uh, in Kijabe, we see about um, between three to eight a day. 
that just come in through the emergency room. So, and they, they come in a, a severity that is much worse than here. There's a, a lot of associated congenital deformities. It's a bad lipomyelomeniticeal. We make do with what we have. So we don't actually have spinal instrumentation hardware. So this is actually a distal radius plate that we would use for um, fixing a, a wrist fracture and we uh, applied it to the spine. The encephalocele that you see uh, are also incredibly rare here in the United States, but uh, come in uh, different types of severities in, in Africa. Hydrocephalus, I already touched upon um, in terms of uh, it being much more common um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the shunt that we use there is the Chaba shunt. It costs about 30 American dollars. Um, just hydrocephalus of severity that you do not see in North America. Some zebras, uh, which are cases that you know you read about in textbooks that you don't see here. So any medical student here? Acromegaly, right? Like huge, huge hands, actually huge cat size and very big nose. Um, and, and here is a, a, a large pituitary um, lesion that actually turned out to be uh, acromegaly. Um, Pus and dermoid uh, lesions uh, are usually like small things in, in the brain here and just are like horrendous, like horrific by the time that they come to medical attention. So how do we look at this, 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 um, this problem, you know, this everything, and, and how can we actually help change lives? Because when you look at the needs, they're, they're huge and, and they're just so, so many. But there's actually opportunities that I've touched upon uh, for public health. There's a lot of um, learning and teaching, and then really a lot of implementation that will need um, non-governmental organizations and, and government uh, to be able to help implement. But in terms of just one-on-one -on -one, uh, for women of childbearing age, kind of helping them select a, a, a diet that would be a little bit um, less high risk, and then um, actually being able to take the, uh, the iron and, and the folate that we discharge them with. And then in terms of neurosurgery, it's actually a huge opportunity in terms of training um, uh, in going to Africa and the rest of the world. So when I try to sell this idea to academic pediatric neurosurgeons, they'll say, well, you know, uh, you know, I have my life here. I have to make our views. I have to go to work. I have a family. Like why, you know, how can we go and help this, this, this huge need that, that really is, uh, has no I mean, has no way to fix this kind of like bottomless pit. But I would say that you, you can see that how um, Dr. Worth has been able to actually change and, and advance the neurosurgical field um, from translating what he did in Uganda and bringing it back to North America. And I think we can do it vice versa. There's a, a lot of um, opportunities for neurosurgical education, things that you only read about in textbooks here that we really need pediatric neurosurgeons to know how to fix by the time that they're done with the fellowship. So to go to Africa and be able to actually be exposed to this and, and, uh, and understand how to, um, how to be flexible as a surgeon and also how to approach diseases in different ways. And also to think about how to um, sustainably deliver care uh, in terms of all of these needs. So in terms of the education component, um, we actually just did a survey uh, of um, the residents and the fellows who came to Kijabe with us and uh, the number of myelomeniticial cases that they did. Um, and here, um, we basically say that if you go for four weeks to Kijabe, Kenya, you will, um, you will have eclipsed the 90th percentile of any neurosurgical resident in the United States for their training, for their entire seven-year training um, in terms of exposure to, uh, to myelomeniticial. So, um, incorporating that into training uh, could be a very uh, valuable thing. And then how to think about, you know, skilled coverage, you know, and then bringing equipment and supplies like Dr. Olufoye said. And then is this really the right thing to do? You know, and I, I fundamentally do not think that medical tourism is really the way to go, right? You can't just go to a place with no, no coverage, no, no neurosurgeon there. Um, no supplies and you just go and do a bunch of cases and you leave because I think you fundamentally change the natural history of say a myelomeningocele and if you get a uh, if you have a surgical complication who's going to take care of that right so you know but going to a place like Kajabi where there is a neurosurgeon there there's actually a, a full coverage full complement of uh, 
pediatric surgeons. There's a fellowship there for pediatric neurosurgery and pediatric surgery, pediatricians and ICU. Um, for that, then we're actually having a collaboration where we, where we do skill transfer, uh, where we do knowledge transfer. And that becomes a, a durable or sustainable type of relationship, right? So you go on trips, but you go to a place where you have a collaboration. And then um, if there's a way to have scholarships to have um, the, the visiting neurosurgeons from the lower middle income country come here to get exposed to different techniques. And then um, you know, think about things like telepresence or, or, um, or virtual mentoring. And uh, some of my colleagues in, uh, in Alabama have done this where they have actually an iPad type platform and they can actually see what the microscope or the endoscope is seeing in the operating room in Vietnam or in Africa and be able to, uh, to, be able to help train the, the surgeons that they've already developed a relationship with and say, hey, for an ETV, okay, uh, well, go a little bit to the right. You probably want to avoid the basilar artery. Okay, poke right there. And then, um, and you'll help the surgeons there develop confidence as well. So the, the model that I would propose, especially for pediatric neurosurgery, because there just aren't that many pediatric neurosurgeons, there are about 200 of, uh, of us pediatric neurosurgeons in North America. So how do we cover the entire world, right? So it's not really like we're gonna make this whole map totally white, but I would propose having oases um, or you know, points of light where you can actually find um, collaborative neurosurgeons in, in centers that are going to be pediatric neurosurgery centers that can help provide care. So um, global partnerships, and uh, there's a global initiative for children's surgery. There's an international society of pediatric neurosurgery. There's already a lot of work being done, uh, but a lot more needs to be done. So thank you all for your interest. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. Our next speaker is Dr. Guy. Dr. Guy is a kidney, pancreas, and transplant surgeon who serves as director of kidney and pancreas transplantation at Drexel University School of Medicine. In the service of global health, he was instrumental in an international effort to start a living donor kidney transplant program in Guyana, South Africa, and extend it into the Caribbean basin. Uh, currently, he is also developing a cadaveric kidney transplant initiative in Guyana. Please welcome Dr. Guy. Thanks everyone for uh, inviting me. <coughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about specific program uh, that I helped uh, start in Guyana, it's actually South America, not Africa. And that's very common that you go, Guyana, Guyana? Um, one's in Africa, one's in uh, in uh, South America. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about why should you go abroad or go on a mission, and I think the previous uh, speakers have uh, actually covered that a little bit, but we'll talk about it for a second. Um, I want to mention the Declaration of Istanbul. Anytime you're doing transplant anywhere um, in the world outside of the first world, and even in the first world, there's always a concern about uh, transplant tourism and, and organs for sale. There was a, an issue in, uh, in China where uh, prisoners of conscience uh, are uh, condemned to death and their organs are, are taken. So there's a lot of uh, problem around the world which we have to always be vigilant and, and think about. Uh, then I want to put uh, Guyana in, in context um, and also talk about renal failure because um, that's really not thought about in most uh, of the uh, developing countries. Look at a little bit of the outcome data and summarize the uh, mission. And then always we're feed, feeding back on ourselves, trying to figure out what, what do we do wrong, what can we do better. And so I put that under the head, head of uh, challenges. There's lots of challenges. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, Maybe during the question uh, and answer period, we can go over some more. So why go on a mission? Um, uh, you can go as a one-time event. Um, you can pursue a career. It sounds like some people are, are doing that. Um, you can be a planner. You can be an administrator. Um, but it uh, gives you um, a new perspective on, uh, on the world, a different cultural lens, if you will. 
Um, I've always had a lifetime interest in travel and, and, and other cultures. In college, I got a degree in anthropology, which I think that was much valuable to me as my medical degree. Uh, at that time, I worked in Guatemala and studied in Guatemala for six months. Um, and then went to, to Johannesburg in South Africa and worked in one of the townships and worked in medicine, uh, ER, and ob -GYN. I walked, I walked The first night I went on to the uh, ob -GYN ward, I was, uh, the nurse came and said, Doctor, I said, no, I'm a medical student. They said, no, you're a doctor. I delivered this uh, baby, and it was a high force of delivery. We write, we read about it, but you don't do it. And like the other speaker said, um, you get experiences uh, that you're not going to get anywhere else. Uh, <clears throat> I attended a World Health Conference in uh, Cuba, and I actually got to meet Fidel Castro, who asked me if I played basketball. And um, as a practicing surgeon, I've been to Israel and helped a, a good friend of mine uh, do uh, liver transplants. Um, so I'm a multi-organ, double organ uh, transplant surgeon. And currently I'm uh, helping uh, develop a, a transplant uh, program in Guyana. Um, and as I mentioned, the, uh, the Declaration of Istanbul is about organ trafficking and transplant tourism. Uh, and it's a, uh, an attempt uh, for the transplant societies and international societies of nephrology and this particularly focused on kidney because that's the major and easiest organ to, uh, to sell, buy and sell, um, but it applies to all uh, tissue. Um, and um, the, the, one of the goals is to promote transplantation and bring uh, life-saving treatment to all countries, but assure protection to donors, both deceased and living, as well as the recipients. So primarily, it's a donor issue. So what about uh, Guyana? Uh, the gentleman on the right of your screen is uh, George, George Subraj, essentially a self-made uh, man, uh, rags to riches type story, came from Guyana and um, made a lot of money in real estate in New York and Queens, and uh, is also uh, Indian. Um, and uh, wanted to uh, give back to his country. He was uh, friends with my friend, uh, uh, Roel Jindal, who's to the doctor here on the right, and there in the middle, the taller one. Um, so he and I were uh, fellows together at Mount Sinai and uh, maintained a friendship, and uh, he started the program. Um, to, there's essentially, starting these programs, this intersection, I think, of three elements, interest, finance, and expertise. So George had the interest in the finance, and uh, uh, Dr. Jindal and myself had interest and expertise. And we brought those together um, in a place of Guyana because George, because that's where George is from. Uh, uh, Guyana is a formerly uh, British Guyana in, in uh, South America. It's next to Venezuela on the, on the west, uh, Suriname, which used to be Dutch Guyana on the, on the, uh, on the east. Um, it's a very poor uh, country. Brazil is on the south, and it's essentially a tropical uh, place, uh, Brazilian rainforest. Most people live on the northern coast on the Atlantic Ocean, which is the southern Caribbean. Um, and primarily, uh, it's a population that lives in a rural area. About less than 30% are urban versus in the United States, it's close to 80% of the, of the uh, population are in urban, uh, uh, urban setting. So you, you have people in a, in a rural setting uh, with poor uh, water um, and very poor conditions. The ethnicity um, basically reflects what the uh, British uh, did when they colonized the world <coughs> in the 1800s. Um, at first, <coughs> excuse me, um, blacks were imported to, to, uh, as slaves, and then uh, there was a slave revolt in Haiti, and so they saw the writing on the wall, so they started bringing Indians around to all of their colonies uh, as uh, labor, but they paid them, even though it was a, what was called a coolie wage. Like, there's also a smattering of American Indians, 10%, or the native Indians in, uh, in the southern, in the Brazilian rainforest. They primarily still are in the uh, rainforest. The uh, language is uh, English, which made it easy for us to go down and uh, start a program. The, um, it's got a high birth rate, 15, uh, so we're comparing Guyana and the uh, US, uh, 15 per thousand versus 12. Um, I would draw your attention to the urban population, it's uh, less than 30% versus about 80% urban population. The life expectancy is 68 years versus almost 80 uh, years in the U.S. And the mean age, again, working back to the first speaker, the median age is 26 years versus 37.8, almost 38 years uh, in the U.S. And there's a higher, also a higher incidence of HIV in that uh, country. 
Um, so why pick uh, transplant? Why pick kidney disease? Uh, is it worth focusing on? And I would contend, yes, it is. Uh, the National Kidney Foundation uh, estimates that 10% uh, of the world population has chronic kidney disease. Uh, the NHANES study, which is National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is essentially a cross-section of the U.S. population, uh, and our population in the U.S. is 316 million, states that uh, close to 15% have either CKD stages 1 through 5, and uh, getting more severe 3 through 5 uh, is 7%. Uh, so it's, we're looking at 22, almost 23 million people um, are getting um, close to dialysis. We don't really know how fast you go. There's not good data from how fast you go from stages uh, three, four, five to uh, end stage renal disease, especially in the United States, because we have really good options. We have skilled physicians, medicine, and uh, access to, uh, to uh, dialysis. So let's just look at the ESRD population, the end stage renal disease group in the United States. Uh, the total number of patients that are under treatment or, or have been treated right now is close to uh, 700,000. Almost a half million are on dialysis, and uh, close to uh, 200,000 have had a transplant. Um, every year, it's, it's uh, recorded there's about 100, over 100,000 people that develop or go on to need dialysis or have failure, and um, they have a lot of options. Uh, and then there's the annual death rate of uh, close to 90,000 in the U.S. of all of these uh, individuals. So it's about 10, 11 percent of our country that have access to treatment are dying. And that's going to be 100% in a, in, a, in a country like uh, Guyana that has no uh, treatment or no good treatment. <clears throat> so extrapolating from the NHANES data in, uh, from the U.S., Guyana, uh, uh, we'd expect that the CKD 3 through 5, if you have CKD 1 or 2, you're not going to know it. But if you're uh, getting down where your uh, kidney uh, 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 creatinine clearance is in the 20, 30% range, uh, you're going to need uh, treatment. And that's going to be in the 50,000 or so uh, people are going to be at risk. Um, we think about the economical effect of that. What, what is the problem with having renal disease or renal failure? And it's a big deal because that's the population. Again, this is a much younger population, and that's a population that uh, are, are trying to make ends meet. And if you, if you have uh, renal failure, you're going to deplete your uh, household resources and you're going to die within a year. So um, you're each of the households that has a, a person um, uh, being damaged by this. Um, a transplant is very costly up front, but it uh, allows that vital individual to return to work and to continue to contribute. Um, the standard recommendation here in the United States and Europe, wherever, is uh, for dialysis, if you have renal failure, three sessions a week for four hours a session. In Guyana, the government gives you about $5,000 and um, you know, it's sort of a one-time deal. This is what we can afford. And you go off uh, typically to a private dialysis center and you can stretch that out if you go twice a week to maybe three, four months. Um, when we started going there, that actually was helpful because we would see the patients before, then we'd, we'd try to come back in three or four months and do a transplant. Uh, but typically the, the funds run out, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, and the person usually just goes on to die. They just go home and they stop. Uh, uh, they just lay down and die, essentially. Um, so renal failure um, is not thought of as a killer. It's, it's essentially a mass killer because people don't attribute uh, their, their death to renal failure. It's, oh, I'm, I'm dying because I have renal failure. They, they get uh, pulmonary edema. So they think they have pneumonia. They think their asthma is getting worse. Um, um, they have pulmonary issues and also heart failure, CHF or have an MI. And so the statistics aren't well um, looked at or reported there anyway, but um, it looks as if, um, you know, it's, it's a sort of a hidden, uh, hidden problem. So by, by going down there, we're essentially bringing this hidden problem to light. Um, in the United States, if you have ESRD, you can have indefinite access to dialysis. You can get on uh, DonorNet, uh, you can get listed for a transplant, which is an electronic, national electronic database and you can potentially get a, a, a transplant, and usually it takes about four or five years to get one. So we're keeping all these people alive for many years on dialysis. There's actually a very high survival rate. Survival rate for a cadaveric kidney transplant is between eight and 12 years. That's the half-life, so 50% go on for more than uh, roughly around 10 years. Um, in Guyana, 
you don't have treatment, you don't have access, and so there's a low survival rate. Um, so in terms of uh, bringing a medical surgical mission to this country, there's a lot, it's a lot to do. It's not sort of a once and done thing where we fly our people in, fix the, the club palate. I'm not trying to say that pejoratively, but a lot more that we have to put in place. Um, we have to do a lot of administrative uh, prep work. Uh, we're trying to create a public-private uh, partnership. We need financial coverage, medical education. Um, we need to do actually do with those uh, recipient surgery. And then follow-up is really key. Um, doing uh, the surgery, it's not enough to just do the surgery. Take a kidney from somebody and give it to somebody else. You have to follow that and make sure the donor's going to be okay and the recipient's going to be okay. The person dies within a year of sepsis, you really haven't done anybody any good. Um, we also need to do better data collection. Right now, we're working on some legislative initiatives with the government. Um, so, how did we do what the program um, that we've done? Uh, we've done uh, 32 uh, cases so far. There's actually a transplant surgeon there now who's gone on to do uh, uh, more cases, and I'm going down in, in uh, May to help him do a couple. We're going to try to start laparoscopic uh, donors. Um, we've had 10 confirmed deaths. We had six people lost to follow up after about a year. So the, in the 10 deaths confirmed, that'd be a mortality of about 30%. And if we added the, uh, the six deaths, because they may have migrated out of the country, we don't know. People go to Canada, they go to India, or back to the UK. Um, but overall, uh, we're going to say, if we're going to add the uh, loss to follow-up to about a 50% mortality. Um, so looking at patient survival with the functioning graph, and by the way, we had no uh, primary malfunction, so a transplant, there's different measurements that we look at. If you put the uh, organ in, does it work right away or does it fail? Primary malfunction. We've actually had none of those, um, and um, uh, eight uh, patients, we don't know what their length of survival is, but looking at the data for one year, it's about a 66% survival. Compare that to the United States, which is about 90 plus, 93, 97, 95 percent uh, one year survival. Our three year survival is about uh, close to 50 percent, but I'm adding in the uh, people that are lost to follow. So it actually may be a little bit better than that. And again, uh, five years, which is another uh, metric that we use in the US, it's, again, it's about close to 50 percent. Um, um, the causes of death, the known causes of death that we, we we're aware of um, were, are eight out of the 10, and um, six of those were sepsis. So sepsis is really um, a problem, as you can imagine. 75% of our known deaths were sepsis, and that's probably related to the uh, issue of clean water. There's not clean water there, um, and transport to the hospital. A lot of people, they don't feel well, they stop taking their meds, they run on the meds, and they don't come back. But we don't have a good uh, interactive um, uh, uh, long-term uh, in-country uh, person watching the watching things there. At least we didn't, we do now. So um, how did we do? We uh, showed that we can bring renal transplantation uh, safely and ethically and uh, perform it in the context of developing country. Uh, we have acceptable patient and graft survival. Um, the patient and graft survival does improve the sustainability because you have an in-country uh, um, uh, team. Um, it's a, you can bring complex programs, as the other speakers have shown. Uh, you come on neurosurgery in a developing country is pretty amazing. Um, it can be ethically and successfully implemented in developing countries, but you need careful planning, proper resourcing, and you need cooperative, coordinated efforts between the host country, their medical facilities, both public and private. We, we've used both hospitals down there, and the public, the private hospitals tend to be uh, much better uh, outfitted. And, um, this coordination between the visiting surgical medical team and also the, uh, the sponsors of those teams. Um, the quality and complexity of the healthcare system and the medical education are raised. So we're raising the quality of things in the country. Uh, and we're also, in this case, for renal disease, we're raising an awareness of renal disease and its scope. Um, and all of the things that lead up to it, basically hypertension and diabetes. This is a, a, a population largely of black and Indian, and in those populations, Diabetes and hypertension are huge. So, um, we're raising awareness of that. This also honors the legacy of uh, Mr. Subraj Pigiana Nadu. And uh, I certainly want to acknowledge Dr. Uh, Jindal. He is primarily the driving force uh, who initiated this and other uh, missions. We're also doing um, uh, cornea transplants there now. I'm not doing it, we're bringing that uh, 
ophthalmologist to do it. So we're doing cornea transplants. So we have a public health program looking at the diabetes and hypertension screening in, out in the countryside. We have to think about the challenges that come up so that we can um, make things better <laughs> for ourselves and how we deliver uh, this care and make our, our uh, coordination with the government and, uh, uh, and do better follow-up. So coordination is always an issue, uh, follow-up, financial coverage, and we always need, especially in transplant, to maintain a high ethical and uh, legal uh, standard. So looking briefly at the, at the challenges, uh, coordination with the government, we can do better. Um, the problem for us is that the government changes every uh, four years and new ministers of health come in and they may have different, um, uh, they may have different uh, desires, and, and, uh, but primarily they're actually focused on uh, primary health care. And so we're essentially, this is a primary health care type program if you think about it, because we're, we're doing uh, education in, um, in diabetes and hypertension, the causes of renal failure. Um, follow-up is a huge problem. We lost six people to follow-up. That's a big deal. Um, it wouldn't fly in the United States, <clears throat> and we've got to do better on that. And that I think we, we are going to do better now that we have a, an in-country uh, transplant surgeon. Um, financial coverage, we were not um, that good at doing cost projections initially. Um, some of the private hospitals felt like they were getting it over their head. We were asking them to donate time, theater time, not do their own cases, and um, we've had some, uh, some, some pushback. Um, I think that we can do better. We're going to do uh, more cost analysis and then discuss that with the hospitals going into it so they know what they're getting into. And as I mentioned, always important um, to have uh, our eye on the ethical and the legal uh, standards um, uh, internationally. Uh, and we're now uh, involved in trying to present uh, legislation to the Ministry of Health and to representatives of the government to, to try to get these uh, laws that other countries have uh, enacted. So um, go into these things with your eyes wide open. Um, be, be aware of your surroundings, um, your possessions, especially the equipment that you need. Make sure you know what it is. Um, these are sort of common sense things. Break down the challenges that you encounter along the way and try to reflect on a solution as you're going along. Um, if you uh, if you have a little talisman that makes you feel uh, successful, take that with you. And also go in with your heart wide open. Uh, you have to be very respectful of your host country. Don't take uh, don't take chances. Don't don't uh, um, comport yourself with you know professionally and respectfully. I've been in these situations. I'm sure everybody else has where. Uh, people give you pushback, and they, they, they are, they're, uh, you don't feel like you're being respected or appreciated. It's okay. Just go with it. You're a guest at somebody else's house. <clears throat> so enter the mission with your uh, enthusiasm and also embrace the country and embrace the mission. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Guy, Dr. Lamb, and Dr. Olatoya up to the front for our Q&A session. Uh, we'll now open the floor for any questions uh, that uh, the audience might have. Um, our, one of our problems is that we don't have, there isn't a, there isn't a nephrologist here. Um, so, like some of the other speakers said, you, you basically work with what you have there. Um, some, some types of missions, like the Project Smile and those things, everybody flies in, they take, you know, they, they do the surgery, and you don't need to coordinate that much because the, the post-op, um, is not, it's not 
it's not that big of a problem. Um, in some of these other things, like the neurosurgery and the pediatric surgery, and, and certainly in, in my uh, situation for transplant, you need to go on and, and have a uh, pretty good follow-up. So that does have to work with physicians or the nurses or healthcare workers, whoever is interested in working with you and gets excited about it and sort of gets tuned into it. So I don't have a nephrologist down in the ARC. Uh, we take nephrologists with us sometimes if we can get one. Um, but we, we sort of, the, the primary, health, primary care people or another surgeon there um, are the ones that we're trying to coordinate the care with. So it's, in a sense, a little bit making it up as we go along and trying to key into the, the individuals there that have that, that interest. And I also want to re reiterate that you've got to work with the administration and the hospitals and the administration and the government. They don't like it when you're doing stuff and they find out about it later. So. Um, I, I'd go along with the theme of you work with what you have, um, but at Kajabe Hospital, it's a, it's a fully functioning hospital with um, uh, a lot of missionary uh, type surgeons who are there long term. Um, some are there for uh, two year assignments and some are there for you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years actually. So um, you, uh, every time I, I go back, um, I learn who's there and, and who's kind of moved on and, and who the new people are. Um, but also um, the, the surgeons who are already there will be familiar with, with, with what's there. So um, in terms of, so say there's a, a head and neck surgeon um, who, uh, who was new, um, the, like three years ago when I went, uh, this is my seventh year going, um, and he uh, and he actually saved up cases. You know, he would say, you know, I really need uh, neurosurgery involvement. We need a combined case, and he would know that when we're coming, and he would actually save the elective cases for the the, uh, the two weeks when we're going to be there. Um, so a, a lot of coordination up front, um, and then also uh, a lot of the skill transfer uh, for what you can do. So um, sometimes we actually train the general surgery residents or the PD pediatric surgery fellows to place uh, simple uh, ventricular peritoneal shunts, the first time shunts, or to close uh, myelomeningoceles when we know that they're going to be taking an assignment that's in um, a uh, more remote area and they're really going to be the front line. So um, in terms of thinking about how you're going to use your resources and how to coordinate that, um, you can get creative and, and you know, uh, teach each other things and uh, and and uh, go with what you have. I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think you work with what's already there. Um, obviously, if you're not going as an itinerant surgeon, there'll be folks on the ground that you're really working. Many times, as you come in, you may be the most skilled person to perform what's there. I think the challenge is for you, for you to not do more than you're able to. There's always a tendency to think, well, I'm the only one that can possibly do this, let me just try. And while that may be true, I think it's important to realize that you can save everybody and you probably do more harm than trying to be a hero and failing than actually just accepting that, you know, this is beyond the limit of my expertise and staying within the scope of what you can do. And likewise also for even when trainees go, if they find themselves in situations where they're unsupervised, realize that you do not go beyond what you're able to do just because you may think you're the, you know, the most trained person around does not give you the liberty to experiment. I mean, this is still lives that can, people can be allowed to die with dignity for a problem that you cannot fix than for you to try. And so knowing your limitations and knowing what the concerns are, but most importantly, you're working with the existing team to provide the best care you can. Yeah. All right, does anybody else have any questions for our sub session? Mm -hmm. At least when I've been to some of these places, the movement is more towards training local people and setting up training programs. That's one of the bigger problems we have in places like Sub Saharan Africa, where there are very few trained local people. Ultimately, they have to be able to take over the reins and, and and manage there, and that's the ultimate goal. What are the barriers that we can do? And what are the barriers that we can we need to overcome over here to coordinate a joint residency program, for instance, over there? 
uh, why, what are the barriers for different medical uh, academic organizations to come together and set up, okay, I'm going to cover May, you're going to cover June, you know, why is, what are the barriers you see to getting more local? I can start off with that, and I think a lot of covered in the next session, actually, on sustainability and things like that, so you can look forward to that. But I think your point is, is a very good one. Most of the time, especially in surgical specialties, it's difficult for people to go for six months and leave your practice and go for six months. So most people are able to go for short-term stints. But it's important to have a group there that you're engaged in, that you're trained. Also have people, for example, in Kijabi, where there are people on the ground that are going to be there for long periods of time. But I think what's, what's, what would be useful, especially in a place like the Texas Medical Center with all the expertise and skill here, is to actually work together so that one institution doesn't have to bear the burden and we can all figure out what are the places we need to go to and find folks that can go to cover different periods of time. So your two weeks and your three weeks and your one month can be in succession and actually have coverage of a place over that period of time. But I think, again, working together and realizing that this isn't something for one group to own, I mean, the problem is huge. And so trying to own one, or one part of it is, is really not great. But if we can all focus on different areas and work together to address that, I think that's a major barrier we need to overcome first. Sorry? I think the, the, Dr. Griffer will be talking about that in the next talk. So that's in evolution with the operation given back to the American College of Schools. Um, for some specialty like neurosurgery, there just aren't that many of us. So there's some um, people on the ground there, and and we see our role, like the North American neurosurgeons, is actually to give um, the people on the ground vacation time or, or sanity time or just time away because the volume is so huge there. Um, so so we coordinate actually going for two weeks so that the the surgeons there can spend time with their families or sleep or. You know, very necessary things. So, um, and that that's kind of how we see our role and from a realistic standpoint. Um, and then in terms of training, we partner with a, um, a neurosurgery training program that's a, already a residency that's accredited in Nairobi, and they send their residents up to Kijabi for the pediatric neurosurgery rotation. So then that's kind of our role, that we would be able to um, uh, do academic teaching and training for uh, for pediatric neurosurgery as as um, that part of their training. Um, in terms of a fellowship, we um, take a uh, a African um, trained neurosurgeon who, who's from Africa and wants to stay in Africa um, and train them in pediatric neurosurgery, and then um, and then be able to have uh, people who are part of the 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 um, the local culture and, and actually speak the local language and actually want to be there. Um, and I think that is, um, that, that's kind of our plan for sustainability. Uh, the, the program, so transplant surgery is very specialized, but um, the actual doing of the surgery um, is through nephrectomy. And uh, we can work with, and I have worked with uh, neurologists um, to help me do the surgery uh, while I was there, and uh, general surgeons. So I, we are doing teaching while we are there. Uh, as it turns out, we, there was a uh, interested uh, general surgeon who went up to Canada and, and did a fellowship and came back. So. We now do have sustainability because we have an in-country uh, surgeon who's running uh, the program there now. We're sort of helping him, um, uh, but it's. I think the programs are wider than just coming in and doing the surgery. You're, you're, you're creating uh, an awareness in the health system and in, by the, in the Ministry of Health, and you're in a sense helping them redirect some resources, albeit limited. Um, and doing um, education. So when we go down, we often get interviewed by the local news station or radio station, and it, it uh, puts a buzz in um, in, the, in the city that um, it, it, it raises people's consciousness and awareness of, oh, there's something called renal disease. Hmm, maybe I have it. Maybe I should check my diabetes. So there, it's, there's the sort of the mass effect of it. 
is the specific thing of doing a transplant, which is only specs rather than but it's, um, it's the ripple effect um, that, um, that I think is also of tremendous benefit as well. And that part is more sustainable, at least in, in these situations, than if the surgeon down there goes, you know, does the brain drain thing and leaves, and I can't go anymore. Yeah, then they might not be able to do uh, real transplants anymore. But they, 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 the, the country has raised its consciousness about these diseases, and so I think overall, this has provided an impetus for uh, in in country training and sustainability. All right. Um, thank you to our three speakers. Um, please uh, give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, um, so now we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, by my clock, it is. It's, uh, so we'll come back at uh, 228. It's about 218 right now. So we'll take a 10 minute break and come back for our second set of speakers. Thank you.